Here we go. Yeah, Katie, do you mind actually stopping the screen share for a quick second? Just while I um, thank you everybody for coming to the Symbiota support group. This is a monthly training that we have um, for topics that Symbiota users might be interested in getting some more training about. It's a it's an hour that you can send all your student volunteers to or your curators or all your admins to remember how things go. Um, and we'll continue to do this as long as it's useful that for the community. I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Jen and I work as the community lead in the Symbiota Support Hub, but I just wanted to introduce a few other people from the hub that are here. Nico, you wanna say hello? Hi everybody, I'm Nico. I'm also at ASU. I'm managing the ASU team. And Laura? Hi everyone, I'm also at ASU. <laughs> and Laura is one of our developers in the portals. Uh, Samantha? Hello, everyone. I am also at ASU, and I'm uh, kind of an international uh, um, um, coordinator for the rest of the portals that are outside the US. That's great. Ed? Yeah, also at ASU, and uh, I've been working with collections for the last two decades. They're in my heart. Love collections. Um, originally trained as a botanist, and uh, but mostly been doing symbiotic programming for the last long time. Great. Katie? I'm Katie Pearson. I'm the data manager for the Symbiota Support Hub, and I am at uh, in San Luis Obispo, California with Jen. And then I'm, um, I was gone for a while, so maybe you have already met our newest member of the Symbiota team, Lindsay. Go ahead, Lindsay. Hi, everybody. I am Lindsay Walker. I am the new community manager. I just joined about exactly a month ago. And I come to this group from the paleo world as a former collections manager. So I can relate to some of the things you've, <laughs> you're dealing with on the day-to-day. -day. That's awesome. And I don't think we also have with us an IT person, Greg, who, um, who helps coordinate the hub. So that's the hub. Okay, Katie, go ahead. Thank you. And so you'll variously hear from all of us and probably more and more Lindsay as things go on. I just wanted to give the community, go ahead, next slide, Katie, an update about what we, how we've decided to tackle the various portal communities. So there's over 40 portals that we know of, um, most of which are hosted at ASU. And what we've decided to do is have Symbiota portal advancement campaigns. And these are one month initiatives where for one month, the whole Symbiota Support Hub team really focuses on one portal with all of their curators, we sort of have support group meetings like this once a week um, to go over various topics, provide any support, fix some backend issues, um, and help curators with sort of what's the thing that's that's in your way that we can help you um, overcome and get your collections moving forward. So we just started this. Uh, we just successfully finished a advancement campaign with the CERNEC portal. And it was really successful. So in that campaign, we got almost 100,000 new images added. We got a bunch of geo-references fixed. We cleaned up the taxonomy. 16,000 names got indexed to the thesaurus, which is important because if they're not indexed to the thesaurus, then they don't come up in searches. We also brought in new collections that had relevant records for the CERNET community. Uh, we switched over some snapshot collections and um, and updated some snapshot collections. And then one of our big initiatives was to try to get all the collections publishing their data to GBIF. And so nine new collections representing 400,000 new records got added to GBIF. And then those will all be shared also with iDigBio. So it was a really successful month working with CERNEC. And we are going to slowly make us make our way through all the portals coming up next. We are going to be working with the um, the Consortium of Southern Rocky Mountain Herbaria, and then probably after that we'll be with Torch. So that's just a update about where we've been and where the hub is going. Go ahead, Katie. All right, so just a few quick reminders. The hub has been making quite an effort to compile and create resources to help you all use and administer your portals. So if you haven't done so yet, I definitely suggest taking some time to check out some of these links, which I'll post in the chat in just a couple minutes um, if they haven't been already. So Symbiota Docs includes written step-by-step -step instructions for Symbiota users. Um, and we'll be taking the lead on most of that, but anybody can contribute to it. 
So for example, if you have some written protocol that you think would translate really nicely into one of those pages, please send it along and we can add it. You can also reach out to us directly because there's always the help desk email, symbiota at asu.edu. The entire hub receives these messages and will respond to you as soon as we can. Um, there's also the support group recordings, which are posted for reviewing if there's something that you want to see again or if you miss a meeting. And then following up with that, um, just another reminder, this is recurring on the first Mondays of every month. Um, event registration and future topics will be posted to the website. And I recommend book bookmarking this page if you haven't done that yet. Um, and we'll post the link in the chat. And then with that, I will pass it over to Katie, who's going to be walking us through the data publishing process from Symbiota Portals. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lindsay. So today's topic is uh, really relevant to hopefully everyone, anyone who is uh, live managing, managing or snapshot managing data in a Symbiota portal uh, will be interested hopefully in publishing data from a Symbiota portal. And this doesn't only mean to aggregators, this means like how do you just download all of your data? How can you see all of your data in one place? So today we're gonna be talking um, kind of through the process and the process begins with Darwin Core Archives. That is the, the main uh, currency for exchanging biodiversity information, at least in a Symbiota um, instance. So we're going to be talking about Darwin Core Archives and just generally um, uh, introducing you to what they are and what pieces they contain. And then we're going to talk about how these Darwin Core Archives relate to publishing to other Symbiota portals because it's relatively straightforward to do that. And um, we'll talk a little bit about why one might do that. And then we'll talk about publishing the data from a Symbiota portal to GBIF and IDIGBio, which are two uh, aggregators of data. GBIF is an international global aggregator and IDIGBio is the aggregator of data from biodiversity specimens in the United States. So. Without further ado, let's go ahead and talk about Darwin Core Archives. So I do want to talk about, again, the, the process and why we're talking about Darwin Core Archives. And that's because your symbiota collection or your data is held in a symbiota portal and a symbiota database, if that's where you're managing or where you have a copy of the data. And the data are stored not necessarily in a shareable format because it's a bunch of different tables, like it's an images table and an occurrences table and all of these tables that make all of the digitization and, and management um, processes possible. Um, but there are processes within the Symbiota code that can then package up all that data into something called a Darwin Core Archive that is a shareable version of your data. And then that shareable version can be transferred to other content management systems. It can be transferred to GBIF. It can be transferred to IDIGBio um, in that because it is this shared um, packaged format. So Darwin Core Archives, like I mentioned before, they're the basic currency of biodiversity data transfer. And what they're just defined, they are a self-contained zip file usually containing mostly all of your specimen data. And I say mostly um, because there may be things in your Symbiota portal that don't necessarily fall within the um, Darwin Core um, extensions, like they're formalized extensions. So there may be some things that aren't necessarily represented in your Darwin Core archive, but the core data, the images, and anything that fits within a Darwin Core extension can be found in that Darwin Core archive. And so you can think of it as like a little packaged up, neatly, uh, neatly wrapped version of your data that then you can share with other uh, people or other organizations or other portals. So it includes um, a couple of key files, um, a meta file, which is an information about the fields that you are using. So the fields, it, uh, it links to the um, standards that are defining the fields that you're using. So the Darwin Core is a biodiversity standards that is shared among IDIGBio, GBIF, 
um, Symbiota, many other content management systems will share data using the Darwin Core biodiversity standards. And so you're, you're pointing in this metadata field saying like, hey, when I say catalog number, I mean the Darwin Core definition of catalog number. Here's a URL to link to that definition. When I use recorded by, I'm using the Darwin Core definition of recorded by, et cetera. Um, Darwin Core archives may also include a, an EML file, which contains information about your collection. So like maybe your description or um, contacts or abbreviations related to your collection. And then the Darwin Core archive will also contain one to many CSV or TSV files. So comma separated value files or tab separated value files. These are uh, pretty simple, just like spreadsheets that you can open up in Excel. It's just that there is only one sheet. And so we're calling it, it is a comma separated value file. So one of these is usually occurrences. Occurrences contains the core specimen data. So if you're just looking for how can I find uh, the data about this one specimen, you'll find it in the occurrences uh, file. Then there will be a, if there, if there is any media associated with it, then there will be um, a multimedia file and that follows another set of standards. And then there, if there are any annotations or determinations, then those are held in an identifications um, CSV file. So you may or may not have seen this screen before, and this is a this is how you download data from the Symbiota portal. And let me open up an example. So if I were just to go download data from uh, some random CCH2 portal, sorry, Symbiota portal, I always use CCH2 um, because I'm in California. And we just uh, search for, let's see, I was an algae, so search for really anything. And you say, okay, I want all of these records and you do a download. Then you'll come to a page that looks like this. And you'll notice that one of the options is to download as a Darwin Core archive. If you keep a compressed zip file, then that means that you're going to uh, keep everything within, uh, within a compressed file. And if you include all of these check marks here, then that means that you're downloading, in addition to the main occurrences file, you're downloading the identifications file and the multimedia file. And in this portal, there is also the possibility to download a measurement or fact file which is another Darwin Core extension file that contains information about traits or really any other thing that is stored in this measurement or fact extension. Um, I point this out just because this is um, where you will find Darwin Core archives very often. And then when you download one of these, you will find many things, or you will find these things that I have previously explained within that folder. So again, here's an EML file, and it's an XML document, which is usually just like a something you have to open in Notepad or Notepad plus uh, plus, or you know, not not a Word document, not a spreadsheet. Um, then you'll see here's identifications. It contains the annotations information measurement or fact, which contains trait data, the meta file, which explains what files and fields are included in the Darwin Core archive, multimedia, and your specimen or observation data. Um, the EML and the meta files, when, when you look at them, with just like a, a, the naked eye, they're not very human readable. So they are in XML format which uh, is a computer readable format. And so you may not necessarily get a lot of information about XML file from the XML files, but they're really key information um, that can then allow important metadata to be stored along with your occurrences. But if you just want to look at the specimen data, that would probably be in the occurrences file. Um, and then all of these four CSV files 
can be related to one another by unique identifiers. And so there are unique identifiers in each of these files that link, um, for example, a specimen in the occurrences file to one or many identifications, to one or many multimedia files, to one or many measurement or fact files. Uh, me measure our fact rows, I should say. Okay, so that's the Darwin Core Archive. And it's relatively simple to create a Darwin Core Archive of all of your data at once. This right here is a screenshot of the collection management window. So you do have to have administrator privileges to create a Darwin Core Archive or refresh a Dar Darwin Core Archive of your collection. So let's go into CCH2 again as an example, you would go into my profile, occurrence management, and then the name of whatever collection you are managing. And then in the administration control panel, you'll see an option that says Darwin Core Archive Publishing. Oh, let's finish that up. And so um, down here on the bottom, you can see where it says publish and refresh Darwin Core Archive data. And so by clicking this button, you are telling the Symbiota portal to make that little packaged up version, the Darwin Core Archive, include your identifications, include your multimedia fi uh, files. And then if you uh, have any sort of redaction in your data, then if you keep this checked, then it's going to redact the data from that Darwin Core Archive too. So if you're trying to send this data to like a, you know, rare plant inventory and they need the rare plant data, if it's redacted in your, um, in, in your actual database, then you can unredact it and send it to them. But if you're just making it publicly available, you probably want to keep it redacted and you can do that. And so it is really simple to publish a Darwin Core Archive. You just click Create and Refresh, and then it's going to package it all up for you. And what that does then is, let me open up another Symbiota portal just to show you. Once you have made this available on a Symbiota portal from your administration control panel, if anyone was to go to the sitemap of the portal, and click Darwin Core Archives, then your collection would be listed on this page here, and anyone could come in and download a copy of the data that you have. And so you can see that they are they can be refreshed. Um, what I did is in uh, CCH2 here was I already had a copy of this data, but it hadn't been refreshed for a few days or, or maybe longer. And so if you do any major changes, you might say, oh, I better refresh my Darwin Core Archive because if anyone comes looking for my data as an already packaged entity, then uh, they're going to get an old version. Um, you do not need to refresh your Darwin Core Archive so that people can view updated data when they're just searching the portal. Those updates are automatically live. But if someone goes to this page looking for a full package of your data, then that will be the version that is described here, or that will be um, according to this publication date. All right, so I have published my or refreshed my Darwin Core archive. And now you can see that the publication date has been switched to today. Megan asks, how often is it best to refresh? Um, most, we recommend at least once a month. Um, but if you do any major changes, like we just uploaded 2,000 images, then that might be a good time to refresh your um, Darwin Core Archive. OK, so let's talk about now publishing data to other, and I have Symbiota portals here because the Symbiota to Symbiota portal um, connector is very easy, um, but you can also use this kind of same technique to publish to other portals or other content management systems, really anything else that needs to ingest a big copy of your data. 
Okay, so first, you just need to publish a Darwin Core Archive file, exactly what we just did. You just click on that Create Refresh Darwin Core Archive. Oh, and one thing I neglected to mention earlier is that your data are not only available on this big page here from the sitemap, but if you go to your collection management page, which looks like this, you can also access it by going to search collections and then scrolling down to your collection or whatever collection you're interested in and clicking more info. Same page here. You can see uh, the copy of their data or your data also from this page listed as the Darwin Core Archive access point. So this is where you can get download again the whole copy of your data. And that's relevant here for uh, publishing to other portals or other content management systems. So when you publish to other Symbiota portals, I'm going to talk about Symbiota portals first. Um, there are two ways that you can do this. You can do this by downloading a copy of your data and then uploading it into the new Symbiota portal. Or you can basically tell one of your Symbiota portals, hey, go get this package that already exists in a different portal. So option A is you can download the Darwin Core Archive to your own computer and then upload that Darwin Core Archive into another Symbiota portal. Or if you have a network connection, like, and they're, they're both two um, hosted portals, then you can just direct transfer from portal A to portal B. So why might one be transferring your entire data set from one portal to another? Well, there are many reasons, one of which is that um, each portal usually has a taxonomic or regional focus. And so what you can do is um, package either all of your data into a portal that might be related, um, or you can package a subset of your data into a related portal. So I can have all of my plant data in one portal, and then I could send a copy of only the bryophytes to the bryophyte portal. Or I might have all of my fungus data in MycoPortal, and I might just send the lichens to the lichen portal. Or maybe I'll even manage my lichens live in the lichen portal, and then just copy or send the updated data into the MycoPortal. So it gets a little bit confusing, but if you, uh, you can think about, you can manage your data live in really any portal and send the data from there um, into really any other portal. So that would require um, applying a filter to your data. So when you want to just upload or uh, transfer a subset of your data from one portal to another, you can apply a filter in one or many ways. Um, and so that way you just get a certain type of data into the portal. Okay, but let's walk through what it looks like to just do a direct transfer from, from a portal A to a portal B. And the example that I have right now is that, um, let me open the lichen portal, that the UC Riverside or University of California Riverside um, herbarium, they have all their lichen data in a database that they have, they manage at home. And then they put a copy of the data into the lichen portal. However, this information is probably also useful for people who want to use the CCH2 portal. So say that there's like a California botanist or ecologist who wants to know what information or what um, specimens live in California. And so they always use the California portal they wouldn't necessarily think to go specifically to look at the lichen portal for California data. So there is a copy of the lichen data in CCH2 as well as in the lichen portal. So what someone can do is from one portal, 
just upload that copy into the other portal. You go to Darwin Core Archive Publishing and you publish a copy of the of the data. Oh, it looks like I can't do it with Riverside. Um, you publish a Darwin Core archive of the data. And let's just say we're going to do it from uh, the California Academy of Sciences. So here is their Darwin Core archive access point. So remember, that's how they, where that came from them coming into Darwin Core Archive Publishing and click it, cre clicking Create or Refresh Darwin Core Archive. And then in CCH2, um, I could put this into, um, in this case, I would have to create a brand new collection that is the California Academy of Sciences Lichens. Right now, just to show you, I'm going to open up another collection and not do the final transfer, do not fear. Um, and you go into import or update specimen records, and then you, do, you click on IPT import. It's not technically an IPT import, it's a Darwin Core Archive import. Um, actually, Ed, should I just click on, hold on, let me go back here. Import. No, either way, just kidding. Either way, you go into import update specimen records, Darwin Core Archive import. And then if you click display additional options here, you can provide a URL to that Darwin Core Archive. So you can either, like I said, download to from your computer and then upload it into this um, Darwin Core Archive importing or you can use a URL. And that URL is the one that was listed on the other um, Symbiota portal. So if I copied that and I put it in here and then I clicked analyze file, it's going to read in that Darwin Core archive because it has that standardized EML, meta occurrences, identifications, because it has all of those um, files, it's going to read it in and um, be able to parse out, okay, this, this field belongs to this field, this field belongs to this field, I'm gonna import all of these. Um, from here, you can actually filter your import. So if I clicked view details here, it's going to show me on the left, this is a uh, field in the incoming Darwin Core archive. And then on the right, that's where it's going to map that information. And if you scroll all the way to the bottom, you can see custom occurrence record import filters. A mouthful, but it basically is a way to filter your data as you're importing that Darwin Core archive. So say we only wanted the lichens that were collected in California. Well, then I'm gonna make sure there is a state state province field, okay, there is. And so then I could say, all right, then only import state province equals California. And so that's one way that you can um, import just a subset of your data. So similarly, if you wanted to, um, you have a huge collection, let's say we're working with the Harvard area and we wanna get just the Guatemala information into the Guatemala portal, well, we would do the same thing. We would find the Darwin Core archive, and then we would filter by just things that have been collected in Guatemala, and then that stuff would be imported into the Guatemala portal. And then I won't go into the whole detail about how you're, um, about the mapping and the images, that is mostly covered in one of our previous Symbiota support groups where we talked about importing data. Um, but this is how you can import data directly using a link to a Darwin Core archive. And then that brings you to this page, which should look familiar from that um, tutorial. 
Yes, exactly. And Laura was explaining in the chat, you can create subsets of your data by filtering from these criteria. Yeah, locality, tax on collector, all those things. If you have a field in here, you can filter by it. Very useful. Okay. So um, if, you're, if a portal or another content management system can ingest a Darwin Core archive, then this workflow is basically the same. So you can um, direct transfer if they have that ability to direct transfer from a URL, or you could download the Darwin Core archive and upload it into your other content management system. It really depends on whether that contact management system can ingest a Darwin Core archive or if it needs it in some other format. But the Darwin Core archive is a pretty standardized uh, format of data sharing. Ed or Laura, do you have any more comments to add to what I've explained here? Yeah, I was just going to say that you could also import data from an IPT in the same way. So instead of pointing to the Symbiota Darwin Core Archive, you would point to the IPT data set. And behind that IPT data set, there's a Darwin Core Archive. Um, and then there's also ability um, to save your mapping and save your filter. So if it's type of thing that you're going to refresh all the time, um, it's good to save that mapping. Um, and the filter so you don't have to rebuild it every time. And that's all. Oh, I have something to add. Uh, I think you can also create um, a Darwin Core archive by, um, if, you, if you search on your portal using any criteria you'd like, and then download the Darwin Core archive resulting from that search, um, if you're like an advanced user and you can host it somewhere publicly, you can also use that URL to import it in any other portal, if that makes sense. Um, so that means you don't have to be necessarily a admin in that collection to import data that way. Um, so. Great, thanks. All right, so now let's talk about oh, a let's question see. for you. There's a question. Yeah. So <clears throat> when you re import the Darwin Core archive from the source portal into the other portal, then does it replace the entire collection with the contents of the Darwin Core file, like on a publishing schedule? Um, it will replace the entire, it will replace the data for every specimen that has a matching occurrence ID or unique identifier in your target portal. So said another way, um, you have all these data coming from this one portal. If there is currently data in the portal where you are putting the new data, it will look for any matching occurrence identifiers or uh, unique identifiers. And if it finds matching ones, it's going to replace fully the data for every matching one. If there is unmatched data, it's just going to input, import the new stuff, but it won't delete stuff that uh, exists in the target portal, but not in the incoming data portal. So as an example of where that's useful, um, within the Panama portal, um, data coming in, I think it's from New York Botanical Garden or Field Museum, I can't remember each one, but they have an IPT provider and they have their vascular plants their, and their ferns in different data sets. But in the Panama portal, you want them imported into the same data set. So you create two import profiles and they will, and then you run both of them and it will put them into that joint data set of just the Panama records within the Panama portal. Does that make sense? Yeah, and then follow-up question, if the source data had a record before, but now does not, 
than what happens in the receiving portal. Like if you change the export filter to exclude a record that previously was published, it would still show up in that in the receiving portal. So there is no deletion of records when you do an import, uh, a Darwin Core Archive import. So when you are importing though, you could set up a stored procedure which runs upon import. So if you do want to run some deletes via the back end, um, you could do that. That requires though the portal manager to assist you with that type of situation. Yeah, definitely. Um, and another I'm sorry, may I just okay. add something else? Um, it's very important to make sure you're using the same um, matching ID. So if your collection for some reason changes the catalog number of the record, um, it means your catalog number will be, if it doesn't find a match, it will be added as a new occurrence. So like misspellings will, might be interpreted as new occurrences, depending on the ID you're using for matching. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, just make sure that whatever you have in your existing data, if you're trying to match data, you have to make sure you're matching on the same field. Actually, for importing Darwin Core archives, I don't think you can match on catalog number or other catalog, catalog number. Can you or? Um, yeah. I think it, it is automatically linked to core it's, ID. Yeah, the it's core ID is usually the occurrence ID or the internal primary key ID. Yeah, if you use the, a Symbiota file, then Yes, it's better to match the internal ID, but if you're bringing something that is not, wasn't in Symbiota before, you might use the catalog number. And that in that case, it's better to have them like matching. Yeah, and so then, that would be a case in which you created a Darwin Core Archive from some other method rather than Symbiota to Symbiota. If you're importing, there's a multi-step thing. So after you import, it goes in a temporary table and there's a little report of how many records are gonna be updated, how many records are new. Always look at that report just to verify that the number of updates and additions matches what you think they should be. So in case that identifier that it matches on does change, um, it'll be highlighted there. For instance, if all the records are new and you know that they're not supposed to be new. Yeah, so here's an example. Um, I just clicked upload, not final upload. I'm not messing up the University of California Riverside's data, um, but I uploaded the um, California Academy lichen data only from California into the temporary tables to upload it into the University of California Riverside collection. So this is the thing I previously set up. And then it will show you this pending data transfer report where it says, Here's how many new records I'm bringing in. Here's how many I found that already existed in your collection. Here are the ones that are not in the incoming data, but still exist in, in the receiving portal. So if this was a huge number and you're expecting to, uh, you were expecting to like, you know, completely intermesh this new incoming data, that would be a red flag because you're like, oh shoot, something is not lining up nothing is being updated, it's all new or old unmatched. So just uh, a word of warning, a word of caution. There is a question in the chat, um, uploading selected data to another portal is useful, but it does rely on users doing this. Why is it not possible to get data from all portals in one search? Um, because not all of the portals share the same uh, database. However, I think Ed probably has a comment on some um, future developments regarding an API that might be able to enable this in the future. Yeah, so each Symbiota portal is its own instance, such as each Drupal site or WordPress site is its own data instance. So um, however, we are developing an API and some additional features that are gonna allow people to search for taxa across portals um, as a custom type thing. So that's in the works. 
API's application programming interface. And Nico makes a really good point that, you know, if everyone's pushing their data up to GBIF and IDIC bio, they could actually do um, complete searches through those aggregators. And that means that's a seamless transition right over to talking about IDIC bio and GBIF and publishing your data from there. So we've covered the basics of your data um, getting into a Darwin Core archive. And now once you get it there, it's very easy to send this information to the global aggregators, GBIF and IDIC bio. So first of all, why are we talking about this? Why is it important to publish your data to global aggregators like GBIF and IDIC bio? Well, why publish to GBIF? There's actually a nice little video on this um, on our um, Symbiota YouTube channel. But the gist is, is that then the data are available for a broader audience um, geographically and across disciplines. So like I was mentioning before, um, if someone is looking for California data, data, maybe they'll go to the California portal, but maybe they might, 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 might not know that there's lichen data or bryophyte data or fungal data um, that is not represented in that portal. And so that all that data is um, enmeshed in the aggregators like GBIF and IDIC bio. GBIF specifically, it also tracks citations of your data, which you can use to demonstrate the impact of your collections. So it's really nice on your publisher page, you can look at a little button that says number of citations and you can see every citation that uses your data. And if we have time, I'll show that um, a little bit afterwards. Also, Jiva produces data quality flags that you can use to help improve your data. So it goes through and says, hey, we found um, these coordinates seem to be mismatched with the country that's in the label, like maybe you wanna look in those. So just an additional data quality tool. Um, and recently, um, the Symbiota Support Hub has become a, an associate participant with GBIF. So we're actually part of GBIF now, which is exciting. Um, and so if you're publishing your data through an IPT to, to um, GBIF, or you're just trying to figure out how to get your data to GBIF, and you're not sure if a Symbiota portal is the right way, um, note that we are, we're closely aligned with GBIF and this is a very, uh, this is an acceptable way to get your data to GBIF um, through a Symbiota portal. So here's our page. Uh, you can come check us out and watch as uh, we get more publishers linked to the Symbiota Support Hub. Okay, so um, one quick thing. How do I know whether my collection is in GBIF? Maybe you're like, oh shoot, I'm the new curator. I don't know what has been done previously. Well, if you go to your collection management page, let me get to that. Uh, let's just go to the Arizona State Lichens. If you go to the collections management page, which you again can go to my profile, management and then select it from here. Then you will see a GBIF data set, data set page link. And if you click on that, then you'll be able to see your data set that is linked from the Symbiota portal. Here's the citations, here's the occurrences, all that. Um, and if uh, a kind of more of uh, a sure way to make sure that your data are or are not already in the portal is if you go to just gbif.org and you click publishers and you say Arizona State University, am I here? <laughs> okay, here are all of the publishers and the data sets associated with Arizona State University. So that's what I already showed. You can see whether you're already publishing from here. Okay, so how if your data are not already going to GBIF um, and you would like them to go to GBIF, the abbreviated version of the how-to is register your institution with GBIF 
and um, someone will put this link in the chat. It's a very simple page. You just fill out the information. Then you check your metadata in the Symbiota portal. And metadata just means when you go into your administration control panel, edit metadata, just make sure that your description and your, uh, um, I guess, your uh, license and your contacts, make sure those are all up to date because GBIF is going to suck those out and put them in your data set as well. So we want to make sure that we have the updated contact information for you. And then you just contact your portal administrator or the Symbiota Support Hub, and we can do the other steps for you. It's very simple. So register, update your contact info, and then just talk to someone with your portal or Symbiota Support Hub. The full story is that we're going to add some information to your uh, collection in the portal. We're going to request some permissions from GBIF. And then we're going to basically tie those two together, saying like, hey, I have data here. Can you let me push my data to GBIF? And GBIF will say, yes, that sounds great. Here's your, here's your permissions. We'll handshake, and the data can transfer over there. So every time from then on, when you click refresh data, then those data are going to also, well, actually there'll be a flag saying, hey, I have new data and GBIF will pick up that new data and uh, import it into GBIF. It might take like 15, 20, 30 minutes, um, depending on how much is going on, uh, but it's very easy to move forward with that. One quick thing I do want to mention is that if you want to get your data published to a uh, to GBIF or IDIG Bio, um, you will need to make sure that your occurrence ha your occurrences have a unique identifier. Um, best practice would be a global unique identifier, which looks like this, um, or can look like this. Um, so if you are going through your these steps that we've talked about, and there's that little red flag that says, you must have occurrence identifiers, talk to us and we can uh, help you through the process of making sure that your occurrences have unique identifiers. If you're live managing in a portal, this will not be a problem, um, but if you're a snapshot, it might. Um, and we already mentioned this, as soon as you refresh your Darwin Core archive, new data can be picked up by GBIF. And if you already have some data in GBIF, but not all of it, just talk to us. Uh, we can figure out how's the best way to update your data or get a fuller uh, encapsulation of your data into GBIF. Nico, you have a comment? Yeah, thank you, Katie. Um, I do. So when we recently got in touch with uh, GBIF, uh, and I should be crediting uh, Gil Nelson here and also David Jennings for encouraging us to become an associate participant. And a note, <clears throat> we sort of discovered that our rate of publishing Symbiota collections to GBIF is actually quite low. Something like 450 collections out of 600 that are live managed are not actually in GBIF. Right, and so there's two interpretations uh, that could be associated with this relatively low published to GBIF uh, uh, rate. Uh, one is historically we haven't really had the approach that when you are joining a Symbiota portal of any sort, there is some sort of social contract that you also have to to publish to GBIF or any kind of enforcement. Right, we've we fostered these sort of a uh, bottom up. Uh, processes to to maybe be aggregating further up, but we haven't really put any constraints on folks. But now that we are also the Symbiota Support Hub, this kind of plays a little bit like we have a bit of a responsibility gap to address, right? And so in that sense, uh, please reach out to your communities and your uh, fellow collections. We represent many different portals here and encourage them to, to take this step to also publish to GBIF. That in some sense uh, to us is also a bottom-up contribution to sustainability. So if we have more and more collections in the Symbiota portals represented within GBIF, uh, it gives us more weight there. 
uh, we get recognized as an important node and publisher. And we can hopefully pay that bottom up support from you from the different communities forward when it comes to future opportunities to look into the sustainability of all of this. And so it's a relatively uh, direct, I think, line between us increasing the percentage of the Symbiota collections that we can also publish to GBIF and being able to claim we've done something for our sustainability. Thank you. Thanks, Nico. All right, last but certainly not least, I wanna talk about publishing to iDigBio. And it is even simpler in some respects than publishing to GBIF. Um, why do we publish to iDigBio? Well, because it is a, um, a regional, not regional, I guess you could say, regional for the United States aggregator of uh, biodiversity data. iDigBio also has some really cool education and outreach and um, tools that are developed relating to the iDigBio portal. So that could mean that your, your data gets more uh, visibility and more use because of the iDigBio portal. So that's a good perk. Um, the iDigBio portal is a national resource for biodiversity data. And that's an important um, source for researchers, for educators, um, especially using these uh, great tools that, again, iDigBio is developing and leading workshops on and um, having webinars about. So that gets your data into more hands. So to publish to iDigBio, you just publish a Darwin Core archive in, in your Symbiota portal, and then you, be, you email their biodiversity informatics coordinator, Kat Chapman, and she will help you get your data into iDigBio. It's a, a similar um, workflow as just grabbing that Darwin Core archive and pulling it into iDigBio's system. Um, and similarly, when you uh, refresh your data, then iDigBio will pull in the refreshed data. Um, it might take a couple of days, but it will eventually get refreshed in there. So it's as simple as that. Um, just got to email Kat Chapman. Okay, so again, just to summarize, you start with your collection or a copy of your collection in a Symbiota portal. It can be live or a snapshot, either way. It gets packaged into a Darwin Core archive using the Symbiota portals tools. And then you can transfer that data to other content management systems or to GBIF or to IDBio. Um, if you want to, want to give it to GBIF, all you got to do is register as a publisher and then uh, update your metadata and then talk to the Symbiota Support Hub or uh, your portal administrator about setting up that link. And then if you want to uh, talk to IDBio, you want to put your data in IDBio, then you just talk to their um, coordinator, Kat Chat. Okay. So we'll go into questions in just a second. I wanted to, oh, Gil has a comment first. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment about the, uh, that was a great presentation. Thanks a lot, Katie. Uh, if you're sending data to IDIC Bio and GBIF, understand that there could be a slight lag. So you might go look at your records in IDIC Bio, and then you go look at the same record in GBIF and they're different or one's missing. And that's because it just takes a little time, but they'll be in sync by and large. And <laughs> we're worried more about data sets that are matching rather than the actual upload date. So that could there could be a slight difference, but not not for long. Good point. Thanks, Gil. And Gil is the director of iDigBio, so he should know. Okay, just some reminders that we have uh, the Symbiota docs is available for your um, tutorial needs. We have a lot of uh, links to YouTube videos there too. Um, feel free to email us at any time at symbiota.asu.edu. We're here to help. And then uh, this recording as well as other future and the past Symbiota support gr group recordings are posted on uh, this website here. And then next week, we're going to be top talking about the topic of crowdsourcing in the Symbiota portal. So there are some crowdsourcing options in Symbiota portals. Um, 
and we will just talk through how you can set them up, how you can get people engaged, and what are the um, pros and cons of using those tools. And if you would like to hear about a specific topic in one of these Symbiota support group meetings, please let us know. Uh, again, symbiota at asu.edu. So I'm going to stop sharing here and stop recording here.